Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with the Movement System. In this video, we're gonna answer the question, is stretching or strength training better for improving range of motion? We're gonna answer this question with science. We're gonna evaluate this research article, which compared stretching with strength training to see which is better for improving range of motion. When it comes to strength training, we've probably all heard different things in terms of what its effect is on range of motion. Some people say that full range of motion strength training can actually improve range of motion, whereas other people say that if you strengthen a muscle, you're gonna actually tighten up and shorten that muscle. So today we're actually gonna evaluate what the evidence says over many studies to determine if those claims are true or false. But then at the end of the video, I wanna actually give you guys my breakdown of how I would actually apply this information to my own athletes, as well as talk about some of the other research around stretching and the potential benefits. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So to start off, we've probably all heard of the benefits of stretching for increasing range of motion. This is a pretty common practice, and if we think about flexibility, the first thing we probably think of is stretching. There are different kinds of stretching, including static stretching, dynamic stretching, and PNF, or proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitated stretching. So within this study, they use different protocols of both static and dynamic stretching. So to get an idea of what we're looking at, the systematic review that we're reviewing is at the top of the pyramid of evidence. This means that it's filtered information and it's a review of many other randomized controlled trials. This just means that the researchers looked at a lot of studies that exist out there and chose about 11 of them that met specific criteria for this study, and then they reviewed the results of those 11 studies. Of these 11 studies that were reviewed, there were a total of over 400 participants included. Those participants ranged very widely from young to very old. Some were actually very well-trained participants and others were in chronic pain and had fibromyalgia or chronic neck pain. So it was a very big range of people included in this study, which makes these findings somewhat generalizable to the general population, but not that specific to one population of highly athletic or highly flexible people, for example. If we studied, for example, a group of dancers, we would probably come to different conclusions because their hip anatomy is very different than the average person, as well as their capacity to tolerate higher volumes of stretching or training. So when we think about these results, we want to think about these more in terms of the general population. Also, we do have to consider that the study designs were different for all of these different studies. They had different protocols for what strengthening exercises were used, from compound moves like bench press and leg press, two more isolated moves for strength training. Some tested the shoulder, knee, elbow, neck, trunk, ankle. There were a lot of different range of motion protocols assessed here. The only real requirement was that it was a standardized test measurement. On one hand, this is good because it helps us generalize the results to more than one muscle group. But on the other hand, it doesn't give us a specific protocol for what would be best for any specific muscle group. Knowing that, let's look at the results. Those 11 studies all came to different conclusions, which you can see in this graph. Some of those studies favored stretching and some of those studies favored strength training. And what you could probably tell already is that this is pretty evenly split between the two. Like I said, there were 11 different studies, which is what these dots and lines represent. And of those 11 studies, they all came to slightly different conclusions. If you're just looking for evidence that proves that stretching is better than strength training for range of motion, you can just pick one of the studies on that side. And the same goes for the other side. But what we wanna do as objective scientists is to look at both and come to the overall conclusion. And that's exactly what this study does. So considering both sides and what the overall literature is pointing towards, this was the conclusion of this study. Strength training and stretching were not different in their effects on range of motion. There were a lot of qualifiers after that conclusion statement and that more research is warranted, and that's pretty typical of most research reviews. They're gonna say something like that towards the end. So it's not like this study, even though it did include a lot of evidence, it's not like this is one conclusive answer to all of your questions. Rather, this just gives us an idea of what the overall evidence is saying and what applies to most of the general population. But if we have specific cases, we wanna consider those a little bit differently. One criticism you may have of these results is that these protocols were pretty general and basic, and you very well may get better results if you did a more extreme strength training protocol or more intense exercises. And same goes for more intense stretching routines. A lot of these stretching and strength training protocols were just two, three, four times a week and fairly low intensity. Whereas if you were training someone more elite or really trying to develop more world-class flexibility and strength, you may see different results from these more intense exercises. For example, the leg press exercise that they used, 
may improve range of motion for some people, especially some people who are untrained and just don't get into deep hip and knee flexion very often. But for someone who's already training regularly, this exercise may not actually provide very good results for improving range of motion. For a more well-trained person, I may choose an exercise like this single leg hamstring curl machine and then have them lean forward so that way they're actually training at a full range of motion with some hip flexion and full knee extension. This combination would actually put them at a very long length where they're trying to activate their hamstring and could potentially improve fascicle length or flexibility much better than a basic strength exercise. In general, I think full range of motion exercises will provide better outcomes for improving flexibility than partials. Partials, I don't know that they're necessarily gonna tighten you up or not. I don't think there's a lot of evidence on that. However, bodybuilders and other very muscular groups of people can have shortened range of motion just from, for example, muscle bulk between the calf and the hamstring, limiting the degree of knee flexion that you can reach. If flexibility is a concern, having a ton of muscle mass probably isn't gonna be the optimal strategy. For those of you who are wondering if you should include stretching for its other benefits beyond just range of motion, let's dive into that. Some other benefits that have been reported in regards to stretching have been decreased muscle soreness after workout or decreases in DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. There's actually mixed evidence on this and I would say based on what I've seen that there's likely not a strong relationship between stretching and decreasing muscle soreness. It's two different mechanisms and stretching may feel good temporarily, but it's probably not going to significantly decrease the delayed onset muscle soreness that you're going to experience two to three days after your workout. Another point you may be thinking about is stretching to reduce the risk of injury. And this is actually a fairly debated topic. Previously, it was almost common knowledge that you had to stretch to decrease your risk of injury and everyone was stretching before, for example, soccer practice. This is something that I did. Our whole group just did static stretching right before going into soccer practice. But this really has fallen out of common practice because there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that stretching alone can decrease your risk of injury. In fact, stretching may temporarily decrease power production and is typically not recommended prior to practice or competition. This really brings up the debate of mobility versus flexibility and doing things like end range strengthening. And if you guys are interested in a video about mobility versus flexibility and some of the different mobility techniques that are out there, let me know in the comments and I can look into that. Overall, based on the evidence and what we've been talking about today, my approach for most people would be to include a short amount of stretching, potentially around 60 seconds per muscle group, three times a week. This is not a lot. It's three minutes on your hamstrings a week, three minutes on your hip flexors a week, and maybe three minutes on your lat extensibility or your overhead reach per week. That's about nine to 10 minutes of total stretching per week, which really isn't a ton. I think for most people that's gonna cover it. If they have, for example, a dorsiflexion limitation, we may add that in. But for most people, 10 to 15 minutes a week of static stretching is gonna get 90% of the benefit of doing a much longer, more intense protocol. If flexibility is a limiting factor for your performance, such as cheerleading, dancing, synchronized swimming, where you need to get into extreme positions, I would actually increase that protocol and get more of those smaller benefits from longer duration stretching. But for most people, flexibility isn't a huge limiting factor in reaching their performance goals. With all that said, what do you guys think? Is strength training enough for your general fitness clients? And again, if you guys wanna learn more about mobility and some of the more advanced techniques, like my thoughts on functional range conditioning and pails and rails and stuff like that, go ahead and drop a comment and I may cover that in a different video. Subscribe if you wanna see that and other future videos. And make sure you go ahead and follow along on Instagram at The Movement System, as well as follow The Movement System podcast for a more detailed breakdown on different topics. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one.